Welcome. We'll, we'll get started. Um, um, I, I see quite a number of, of empty seats, particularly in, in the if, if you are holding a seat for a friend, uh, this is probably the point to give up and, and make that seat available to anyone nearby so, uh, so that as many people as possible can, can be seated. Um, those of you who are seated in the aisle, let's try to keep one half of each aisle free, if possible, uh, for mobility. There's some more space in the front here and in the front on this side. We will be, be moving a lot of our practical business of the course to email, and I sent out an, an email this morning with a, a lot of basic information. Some of you are not yet on the email list, so I'll just uh, review that uh, until everyone is, is registered in the system. Um, for the first rapid re response reflection, these very short commentaries, that you're doing after each interview, uh, the question that I'd like to, you to think about is which argument that Professor Lifton made in the book and or the interview was most surprising, intriguing, or distressing to you? Do you find the argument persuasive? Are there counter arguments you might want to offer? And again, that question is in an email that all of you should have received. If you haven't received it, give me your email address afterwards and I'll add you to the system. So that's a, a brief uh, rapid response reflection, as we call it, that uh, you should uh, send in later today or any time before 9 a.m. tomorrow, depending on what your sleep schedule is like. Um, to post it, you go to the course website, you click on Discussions, which is in the left-hand column, and then you will see a screen that looks like this. So you find your section, uh, let's say it's this one, and then you find um, oh yeah, thank you, uh, Robert J. Lifton. You click on his name and then you see the option post message uh, and you click on post message and then you can uh, paste your message from Word or another program into this space and click here for post message. Uh, no, it's, it's. As, I, as I mentioned in the email, uh, your, your rapid response paper uh, needs to be written in Swedish if you're not good at Swedish, there are phrase books available on reserve at Lamont, uh, which, which may help you. When you're on, when you're on the course website, uh, you'll see our course-wide discussion list. Thank you. Um, this, is, this is a place to uh, post your comments on issues discussed in the course, uh, a place to give uh, links to articles you find interesting, alternative sources of news that you use, uh, a place to announce upcoming events, and there's usually um, a, a lively discussion. Already I think there are eight or ten messages, so you may want to check that list at, at the time that you're posting your, your own assignment. We will be meeting again this Friday to see the film Born Rich, uh, directed and narrated by Jamie Johnson, the heir, Johnson, the heir of Johnson & Johnson, who will be visiting us in March. And this is the, the few Friday sessions that, that we have. Uh, it will go from 3 o'clock until about 4.20, because the film uh, is just a little longer than our, our session. There's no writing assignment associated with that film. Professor Robert Lifton is known around the world for his studies of Nazi doctors during World War II, the medical aspects of nuclear war, suicidal, 
ap apocalyptic sects, Hiroshima, Vietnam. We have, we have read his book on apocalyptic thinking in an age of terrorism. Trained as a psychiatrist, Professor Lifton has worked at Yale, the City University of New York, and now Harvard Medical School. As an extraordinarily prolific writer, his books include Hiroshima in America, 50 Years of Denial, The Protean Self, Human Resilience in an Age of Fragmentation, The Genocidal Mentality, Nazi Holocaust and Nuclear Threat, The Future of Immortality and Other Essays for a Nuclear Age, The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide, Death in Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, the Broken Connection, Indefensible Weapon, Political and Psychological Case Against Nuclearism, and an edited volume, Last Aid, Medical Dimensions of Nuclear War, as well as a book, Home from the War, Vietnam Veterans, Neither Victims Nor Executioners. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert J. Lifton. Thank you. If I could take the liberty, as usual, of asking the first question. In this course, we are interested in people who engage boldly and seriously with the times in which they are living, people who confront the brutalities and terrors of their own historical moment. And I want to ask Professor Lifton, how did, how did you become such a person? What, what were the roots of your engagement with some of the most painful questions uh, of our time? I'm not sure exactly how it happened myself, but uh, I would start by saying that I was rescued from a conventional life by the American military, which drafted me as a young doctor, a young psychiatrist, and sent me immediately to the Far East. But I've never really shown my gratitude to the military for having done that. Uh, I was sent, to, uh, I had been trained in psychiatry, in medicine and psychiatry, and then later on in psychoanalysis, but I was sent out in the middle of my training because there was a doctor draft in those years, in the early 1950s, a long time ago. I was a very young psychiatrist. And uh, I was told that if I wanted, uh, I, could be, I, could en I could enlist and become a physician in one of the military services, or I could be drafted as a private. So I enlisted as a doctor in the Air Force and went there. And in any case, I discovered the world by being sent to Japan and then to South Korea, and that changed everything. My last military assignment was to interview returning prisoners of war from North Korea where they had been held by the Chinese Communists and subjected to what was seen as a strange new process, so-called brainwashing, or what the Chinese themselves called thought reform. And that was uh, an effort to really change people's minds and feelings uh, so that they could become good revolutionaries. I later saw it as, a, as an apocalyptic movement in ways that we can discuss, but nonetheless, that was my first study, and I was fascinated by it. Once I'd done that study, I began to see myself as somebody who could study what we call extreme situations. And uh, that's what I did. Uh, I did a later study, uh, as Brian Palmer mentioned, of Hiroshima by going there. And I, I'll just say this one thing and then end this somewhat long-winded answer. But uh, I was here at Harvard in the late 50s, and I came under the inf uh, I was just starting out in my work, and I came under the influence of David Reisman, who was a great sociologist and an extraordinary person who died uh, not long ago. And uh, he was the first faculty person at any university to be the faculty advisor of an anti-nuclear undergraduate group, which was called TOCSIN, T-O-C-S-I-N, meaning ringing the bell of warning. 
And through that influence of David Reisman, when we began to write and speak out against American embrace of nuclear weapons and shelter building and those strange nuclear drills, uh, uh, that interested me in the subject. And when I was in Japan doing other work, I decided to look in on Hiroshima, which led to my Hiroshima study, so that the things one studies are influenced by what one is exposed to politically and ethically. It isn't just that you study things and then become ethically and politically involved. It's your political exposure and what you care about in terms of uh, human beings or humanity that leads you to what you study and how you study it. Anyhow, those are some thoughts. Now we have a, now we have a question from Blake Janelle. Hi, Professor Lipton. Hi. Hi. Um, in superpower syndrome, you mentioned that while studying Nazi doctors, you doubted your ability to carry out your research, um, in part because you were having disturbing dreams in which you were a victim of the Nazis. But then a friend, in a, and who was also a Holocaust survivor, um, said that your sympathy with the victims might actually improve your research. So my question was, do you ever have dreams in which you imagine yourself as a terrorist or as a Nazi doctor? And are you able to empathize with um, people who perform, who, who do such grotesque things? Uh, I never had dreams in which I was a terrorist or a Nazi doctor or in the business of killing. I never had such dreams. That doesn't mean that any of us doesn't have some potential for violence in us, myself included, of course. Uh, but uh, what I, as you said, I did have dreams of being victimized, of being uh, one reason why it was so painful for me to do the study of Nazi doctors is that uh, I began to have these anxiety dreams once I went to Germany, began to, influ uh, began to interview one or two Nazi doctors, in which I, in my dreams I was behind barbed wire in some kind of concentration camp. And what was worse, uh, my wife was there and my children. And it was a horrible kind of feeling. Uh, it was the worst sort of nightmare. And when I told it to my friend, who was himself an Auschwitz survivor, he nodded and said, good, now you can do the study. That's what, as you said, he, he was trying to say, you have to let it in if you're to do a study that has any power. What was the second part of your question about? Uh, yes, about whether I have empathy for them. That's an important question. Uh, I, I debated that with myself. Do I need to have empathy with Nazi doctors whom I... Uh, you know, loathed in terms of what they did in a personal way? And the answer is, to a degree, yes. If empathy simply means imagining your way into their minds, which is what I tried to do. I tried to understand what they did psychologically, not to excuse them, but rather to understand the process and the psychological and historical conditions that were conducive to that destructive behavior. But you have to differentiate empathy from sympathy. I didn't have sympathy for them. I had to imagine my way into their minds, and that is a form of empathy. Some reviewers of the book got angry at that. What do you mean having empathy for Nazi doctors? But the value of the study really was getting inside their heads so that we could understand how people, in their case, quite ordinary people, could lend themselves to mass killing. This Alyssa Clark. The last two speakers we hosted, Cynthia Enlow and Swami Hart, spoke of asking the question, where are the women? The question to you is, over the course of writing the book Superpower Syndrome, did you ever ask that question? Sorry, uh, say it again. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Of course, when you were, when you were writing... Pause for mechanical repair. Yeah. All right. Should I start all, all the way That's over? That's better. Okay. The last two speakers we hosted, Swanee Hunt and Cynthia Enlow, asked the question, where are the women, or addressed the question in their research. Um, my question to you is, when writing your book, Superpower Syndrome, did you ever ask that question? And if you did, why didn't you address it in your book? 
the second part of my question, I have two parts, sorry. Okay, um, that's all right. Is what kind of effect do you think a stronger, a stronger women's presence would have had on the apocalyptic confrontation? Um, your overall question in, in uh, reflecting previous uh, guess here is where is the woman or where are the women? And in various studies I've done, of course, uh, women have been very much present. Most of my studies I've done through interviews with people who had been in some way uh, at the center of a historical event or themselves influence a historical event. There were women Nazi doctors, but I never got, very few of them, and I never got to interview them because the one or two who were still alive died before I could reach them. Um, so women are, as women, are very prominent in my studies, a study of Chinese thought reform or Hiroshima survivors. For instance, among Hiroshima survivors whom I interviewed, there were many women who became leaders in survivor movements of an anti-nuclear kind, and they traveled around the world telling their story of what had happened in Hiroshima. And this was what I came to call a survivor mission. It was a way in which they could both give meaning to their experience and at the same time warn the rest of the world, uh, serve a humane purpose by warning the rest of the world of what these weapons do. Women were very prominent in this process. And as a matter of fact, in the post-war climate of Japan, which is on the whole a fairly patriarchal society, although women have a lot of power within the home and within the family finances, nonetheless, the society has been run by men. Uh, the anti-nuclear movement stemming from Hiroshima gave women a considerable opportunity to become leaders and uh, outspoken in their anti-nuclear position. The more general question you're raising is how much apocalyptic violence is a product of the male mind? And in a way, that's the inference of your question. It's a fair question. Uh, remember, apocalyptic violence, for those who didn't have a chance to read the book or even for those who did, uh, it has to do not just with violence, but violence uh, stemming from a kind of religious idea that you must destroy all or much of the world in order to purify it spiritually. That's what uh, apocalyptic violence really means. I have the impression that the feeling structure and ideas relating to apocalyptic violence are mainly male-oriented in their origins. But that doesn't mean that women aren't capable of entering into it and of uh, sharing some of that apocalyptic projection or tendencies toward apocalyptic violence. This then creates a question, and it's worth pursuing. Uh, the whole issue of gender causation is a difficult one. It's very hard to say how much apocalyptic violence or violence in general is, quotes, male as opposed to female. We know that men are responsible for a greater amount of violence of various kinds in this country and elsewhere. But when you talk about male and female psychological tendencies, it becomes difficult and nuanced. My own sense is, just to put it in general terms, uh, that men and women have differences, but the differences are nuanced. They're never absolute. There's almost nothing that a woman is incapable of imagining that the male mind also imagines and vice versa. But the emphases could be different. And the emphasis upon totality, on complete destruction in order to create complete purification, has something of a male cast which could be looked into further, one which, as I say, women are capable of joining in as well. That's a beginning answer to your question, which has to be pursued by various people in different ways. Andrew English. In your book, uh, Superpower Syndrome, you speak of how the United States is heading to a 
apocalyptic militarization, and you contend that in order to cure itself, the country as a whole must reject its sense of omnipotence. Um, but this is a very general solution, and it, lend, it leads to the question of what specific actions can people take, specifically us as college students who are not people in position of power, to sort of move the country away from this militarization. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, I, I wrote my book, Superpower Syndrome, to try to apply work I've done on other subjects which had uh, some relevance to what's happening now in our country and in the world, uh, and to try to indicate not just that we were taking a, a destructive path, but that our own country was becoming extremist in its behavior. And that's why I talk about superpower syndrome and apocalyptic violence. These are very extreme positions uh, which I write about in my book. And the war on terrorism, uh, so-called now, so, uh, so described by, by our present leaders, is really in itself amorphous and unlimited and has, therefore, apocalyptic qualities of its own. That's the kind of argument I make in the book. And as you rightly ask, the more difficult question is how we reverse this trend and how we change it. What I think is happening in this country is that more and more Americans are becoming uneasy about the administration and its behavior, including especially the war in Iraq, but other domestic issues as well. But I don't think so many Americans grasp how extreme our government is in its apocalyptic uh, expressions and in its uh, Milita what I call uh, fundamentalist militarism, the idea of solving most human problems in a military way rather than in more humane and diplomatic ways. Uh, what comes immediately to mind is, of course, the election, which I think is one of the most important elections in recent American history, because I think that the extremism of the present administration endangers American democracy by its control, its efforts to control this country, and really, as I say in my book, to control the outcome of history, as though that were our prerogative, our sense of entitlement as a superpower. It's therefore of the greatest importance to replace our leaders with some who have a more moderate outlook, what I quote at the end uh, in the words of, of, of the great French writer and philosopher Albert Camus, a philosophy of limits, a recognition that human beings have limits, that we are vulnerable, that we can never achieve absolute security. In terms of what students and others like you in this room can do, there's no one thing. I think one has to work through the electoral process, as I'm emphasizing, and I think it's, it couldn't be more important uh, than this coming election but also in non-electoral places, um, uh, groups, student groups, uh, public demonstrations, articulating what's wrong from your standpoint, maybe what's wrong from the standpoint of students at a university, or what's wrong with the university in relation to these events, in perhaps not speaking out more, or however you see it. Uh, I think where one studies, where one works, where one teaches, where one lives, are all places that can be a source of some kind of uh, confrontation and resistance to what is really a dangerous trend in American life. That's a little general, perhaps, but it's a beginning idea, and nothing is too humble. Everything counts. Everything one does contributes to the general consciousness of, of this country which, and the world, which can be confused and contradictory but yet one is making a contribution, however small, by taking a stand, by saying something publicly, by planning things with one's friends, by forming groups, and really making one's voice heard. Karina de Mayer. Hi. Hi. I'm a psychotherapist myself, and I come from the Netherlands, so for me being here in the States at this moment is quite unique, because I think we are actually at the verge of a very uh, important moment in history. Um, after reading your book, you actually, on the back cover, it says you know, that you really do have hope for the future. 
but uh, which which signs do you see? Because I mean, you were talking about a, uh, be, about a very extreme situation right now. After 9-11, actually, America does go to war, and instead of actually licking the wounds, it like right away attacks another country and actually justifies itself, forges documents, and well, we're actually all in the middle of this. Um, did America learn from 9-11, or do you think that the need for destruction of all humanity, in a way, is so much greater than to go inward and to be humble? And what does America need in order to really embrace peace and to accept its own boundaries? Those are large questions of, uh, and very important ones, and they're similar to the question just asked. Um, I don't think there's anything inevitable about the American response to 9-11. Let's go back to that. 9-11 was an attack, a terrorist attack, on our soil. It was one of the few such attacks in all of our history. It was in... Uh, Nuremberg terms, you know, the, the, the international courts that was set up uh, after World War II, it was a crime against humanity. It was a crime. How does one respond to that sort of event? Ideally, I think, one seeks to understand how it happened and why it happened, but inevitably there was going to be some response in trying to track down the terrorists who were responsible, including some use of force. That was inevitable and justified. But the war on terrorism is something very different from that. First of all, by calling it a war, it's a misnomer and a dangerous one. If you called it an anti-terrorist action, that could be accurate. And if you mobilized our friends throughout the world who embraced us at that time, who wanted to help us, who wanted to share in combating terrorism of that kind, which they opposed, if it became an international uh, effort of that kind, uh, it would have advocated minimal violence rather than maximal violence, and it would have enlisted people and governments throughout the world on what would be seen as a moral cause by virtually everyone, and it would have thereby isolated the terrorists. Instead, we've taken on the so-called war on terrorism, which is apocalyptic, as I mentioned, and which creates more terrorists, especially in invading a country in the Middle East like Iraq, even though it had a cruel dictator, it nonetheless becomes an American, the presence of an American invader in the, in the Middle East and thereby uh, mobilizes various kinds of terrorist uh, motivation. Now, I, I see this kind of behavior reflecting the sorts of extremism I've been talking about here and wrote about in my book, which has to do with our own apocalypticism, our own uh, version of Christian fundamentalism, and our own militarism, those are political policies. They're not an inherent psychological impulse. I don't think there's anything in our human nature that requires us to make war on various countries in the world or to engage in large-scale killing. I think that our human equipment is such that we can go either way. We are certainly capable of great aggression and aggressiveness on an individual and collective psychological basis. But we're also capable of some kind of mutuality and sharing and nonviolent forms of behavior which are in effect in much of the world all the time. So this becomes a matter of choice collectively, politically determined, uh, ra rather than some sort of inherent psychological need. And in that sense, humane political positions and advocacies can help to bring out the more humane potential in all of us, and aggressive and belligerent political policies can help bring out the more belligerent tendencies, which are also a potential uh, in, in all of us. In that way, leadership has enormous importance, but we're not passive vehicles in all this. Uh, we are out there, or should be out there, and we, we have to be heard. We, we have to speak out, 
and we have to help choose a direction that we believe in rather than sitting back and, and having uh, these negative elements brought out. I do think that in many ways the present administration brings out the worst potential in Americans. Uh, it, and it's as if the very same Americans could be capable of much more humane potential. Those are some of the thoughts uh, on your question, and uh, how we go about it uh, is along the same lines I, I spoke of with the previous question, but that tries to take up the psychological issue that you mentioned. Vivek Ramaswamy. Hi, Dr. Lipton. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. I just had a question on chapter five of your book. Um, you devote an entire chapter to describing fundamentalist Islamic terrorism and acts of terror, and you state in reference to the terrorist acts of September 11th, killing is not killing, but only the enactment of a sacred script. Similarly, dying is not dying, but a step to immortality. So my question for you is, to what extent do you believe that religion in general can act as either the cure or the cause of superpower that syndrome. what in general? Uh, the religion in general. Religion in general, yeah. right. Uh, yes, um, extremist religion, uh, and here I was talking about Islamist, not Islamic, but Islamist, meaning fundamental, fundamentalist Islamic or Islamist uh, extremism, can create a sacred script in which um, if you are a suicide bomber or engage in a suicide mission, you're not so much killing as carrying through what you have before you, which is that sacred script of, of it's what I call, uh, in a way, modeled by the Nazi doctors, killing to heal. You're killing to heal the world, and you don't see those people you kill as dying. You, you don't really feel their experience at all because you're focused on that larger script. Extreme religion of any kind can do this. It's not just Islamist. There are expressions of it in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, in all the world's major religions. It would seem that religions can go in either direction. What we're talking about now is the murderous potential of religion or aversions of religion, where the impulse to purification is so great that you must kill everything that's impure, whether it's non-Islamic or according to uh, some of our own impulses, it isn't properly democratic or pro-American uh, and is seen as impure and labeled terrorist somewhat loosely. Religion can then be an ultimate source of destructiveness. But there's another side to religion which has to do with enriching human life and with genuine compassion I've, I've been involved in various anti-war movements and anti-nuclear movements, and the people who are most steadfast are almost always the, the, the peace-minded Catholic priests or Protestant ministers or Jewish rabbis who are committed and bring their religiosity into that compassionate position they're taking or that protest position on the side of uh, humane behavior. So religion can also be a source of ethical passion of a kind that the world needs. And one has to understand, I think, both of those potential sides of religion. Uh, there was a friend of mine who died uh, just in the last year or two, Paul Moore, who was a great Episcopal leader, Episcopal bishop of New York and Northeast. And uh, he was so troubled by this duality of religion that he, he called a conference to examine just this question that I'm mentioning, why religion in some cases can suppress human rights and human beings, why in other cases it can contribute so uh, compassionately to their lives and to the lives of humankind. And there's no single answer, but one has to recognize that potential, that opposite potential in religion. Professor Lifton, you've contemplated some of the most horrific moments of, of the past 60 years from the Nazi period to Hiroshima to more recent um, 
moments of, of terror and suffering. And I want to ask, do you often feel despair when you, when you face all of this material? Do you, do you ever want to give up these studies uh, because it's, it's too hard to be conscious of other people's pain? Um, and what do you do if, if there are moments when you feel despair? What, how do you handle them? Well, uh, sure, I've had my share of pain and something like despair, and some of it was brought out a little bit in one of the earlier questions. Uh, but uh, and <laughs> I, I have a memory of my daughter when she was about 11 or 12 years old uh, saying to me, well, Dad, why don't you study more cheerful things? <laughs> and she had a point. Of course, she's now a clinical psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and you know, I... I I'm aware of, of the pain involved in what I'm studying. And when I do it, uh, one has to proceed uh, both with one's own ethical passion, but also one has to pace oneself, something like an athlete, so that uh, I tell my friends and, and my students, um, don't read the stuff after nine at night because, you know, it won't be too good for your dreams. You can't always follow through on that, but you, you have to somehow uh, do what you're capable of doing and, and not become a martyr to what you're uh, looking at. However, what is involved is always an act of hope in the very process. To me, it's an act of hope that I can study Nazi doctors, that I can look at the superpower syndrome and come up with something that I think is useful, that might have some insight that could lead, however modestly, to more humane directions, or at least suggest them. Uh, one doesn't have an illusion about the immediate impact of one's writing. So the very undertaking of this kind of study is, for me, an act of hope. And then in the studies I've done, mostly by interviews, I've, I've seen people uh, who were subjected to the most extreme kind of pain, whether survivors of Hiroshima on the one hand, or survivors of Auschwitz, uh, both of whom I've, I've interviewed in, uh, extensively, how they could take in that pain, absorb it, and show extraordinary resilience, and then contribute much to the world by telling their stories and bringing truths that we have to face, and also bringing some kind of idea of life beyond that moment of horror or that experience of, uh, of pain. And all that is, is part of my work as well. Uh, in a personal way, uh, of course, one, one needs close friends and one needs love in one's life and one's immediate family. That becomes really important when you're doing studies like this. Uh, and uh, that's just crucial, uh, I think, if one is to keep one's own balance. And one has to have a life outside it, uh, you know, and a bit of a sense of humor. Uh, Brian Palmer didn't mention this, but I also draw humorous bird cartoons uh, and have published a couple of volumes on them just to say more direct, talk about the same things I talk about uh, in my books, but somewhat more mockingly and self-mockingly. Uh, one needs to have a little fun sometimes, and you have to look for places to find it. We're open to some spontaneous questions. Hi. Um, when Hi. Swanee Hunt was here, she talked about um, being in a position of power during the conflict in the former Yugoslavia and the need for the U.S. to intervene in that situation. Are there situations in which you feel that the U.S. should confront the world, and how does one decide what those are and what the appropriate course of action is? A very important question. Yes, I do feel there are situations in which we should intervene. Uh, and I was in favor of intervention in the former Yugoslavia because there was active genocide, even though on a relatively smaller scale. Nonetheless, it was genocide in the sense of ethnic cleansing of a particular people going on in Bosnia and then in Kosovo. And I favored intervention and belonged to a couple of groups that sought to bring about intervention. Uh, I opposed intervention in Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq had been guilty of genocide or genocidal actions against the Kurdish population, his own people and had, of course, used uh, weapons of mass destruction or poison gas uh, in, in the war with Iran. But 
there was no active genocide of any kind that we knew of going on and the idea of a threat to the united states which was put forward by our leaders has turned out to be quite false there was no such threat and no visible weapons of mass destruction so one does have to make choices and and the choices aren't automatic they take wisdom and they take restraint because any use of violence should be done with caution and i i don't believe we should stand by when genocide is occurring we shouldn't have stood by in rwanda or in cambodia or other places any more than in germany and poland on the on the part of the nazis but i don't think either that we should feel that we have the right to unilateral intervention when we judge a country to be behaving badly it requires an active genocidal process or direct mass killing of that kind we'll take a question from the very back anyone um. uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your analysis and your insights into the war on terror, and I believe that open discussions like the one in superpower syndrome are important in bringing about a peaceful, so a peaceful resolution to the present conflict. Uh, in the book, you argue that the United States' war on terrorism is based on American world ambitions and American global hegemony. What do you believe the Bush administration's motives are in conducting the war? Are they not an attempt to bring about stability to a troubled region and usher in a period of greater, greater global security? I think that many people in the Bush administration believe that by uh, invading Iraq, we can stabilize the Middle East and democratize Iraq and initiate a beginning spread of democracy throughout the Middle East and thereby stabilize the area. That's the claim. I don't believe a word of it. I just don't think that's true uh, because we're perceived. I mean, I, so I think that together with the aggressive policy, there is a quality of idealism Wilsonian idealism of spreading democracy. That does exist, and one can't just dismiss it. But the difficulty is that we see ourselves as the arbiters of democracy, that we come and we bring democracy, as opposed to the complex rivalries and uh, contradictions of those areas which need working out by the people of those areas. I think that in, a, in, in the actual effect of what's been done, the Middle East has been further destabilized by our invasion of Iraq because in that invasion, we've created now a guerrilla warfare, a process of guerrilla warfare against us and of some kind of overall resistance, the nature which is not fully understood, but seems to combine Iraqi and foreign forces and have undoubtedly contributed to the mobilization of more terrorists in Al-Qaeda and uh, other Islamist extremist groups. In that sense, uh, it looks as though from what's been said that bin Laden was among the happiest of observers in looking at our invasion of Iraq, knowing that the resulting destabilization would create more possibilities of recruitment for his very extreme and bloody approach. Uh, so uh, while I would answer your question by recognizing those goals that you, that you raise, I think they are real projections on the part of people in the administration. I think they're wrong-headed and uh, dangerously American-centered and part of what I call the superpower syndrome. Our next question is from Kate Holbrook. Dr. Lifton, I wonder, in thinking about your life, was there a moment where you had to make a choice or stand up and do something that required a tremendous amount of courage? And I wonder whether you could describe that moment for us, if one comes to mind. I don't remember any 
great moments of courage. Uh, I, I, do, I do remember some moments of decision. Um, for instance, um, when, uh, when I, just before doing my first study of Chinese thought reform, uh, and, and this initiated me on my nefarious career, uh, my, my wife and I had stopped and my wife and I had decided to take a trip around the world, take a year off, take a trip around the world, and our second stop was Hong Kong. And people I met, was introduced to, had been put through this strange process of thought reform, which fascinated me, which I wanted to study. Uh, but, you know, I didn't know how I could do it, and I was uh, supposed to return back and resume psychoanalytic training and do all the things one is supposed to do. And I really didn't want to, and I didn't know quite what to do. So I took a long walk by myself around Hong Kong Island uh, to try to make a decision, and I came back saying, um, I don't think I can do it, uh, we better head home. Uh, and, uh, and yet, by the next day, the seeming decision I had made was actually the opposite of the real decision I'd made, which was to stay. And by the next day, my wife and I were working on a, a research application to try to stay in Hong Kong and to do this study. And I remember other moments, uh, for instance, in Hiroshima, it was similar to some of what was discussed in connection with studying Nazi doctors. I was in Hiroshima and uh, decided to do the study of survivors of Hiroshima. And uh, my wife and then infant son were still in Kyoto, where I had been finishing some other research. I had moved to Hiroshima, and they were to follow a week or two later. And I had done my early interviews. And there was an enormous difference between talking about doing a study of survivors and then interviewing actual survivors and hearing these searing tales of mass dying and horrible radiation symptoms. It was overwhelming to me. And again, uh, I began to have terrible nightmares. And um, I really doubt, I was alone in a little inn where I was staying. And I really doubted that I could stay there. And I knew it was a very important study to do, but I sort of said to myself, yes, it's important to do, but I don't think that I can do it. It just doesn't seem possible. And yet, within a day or two, I found myself more level interviewing people and trying to understand their responses and trying to sort out their responses in terms of what they were saying psychologically. I came to call this selective professional numbing. That is, I needed enough distancing to be able to take in these horrible descriptions, and yet I also needed enough compassion to feel some of it. And that balance is always imperfect, certainly in my own hands, but uh, that enabled me to stay there and complete the study. The other situations where there are choices that I could make, you know, what we call courage is really a sense that it's right for you. I had done the thought reform study, there was the opportunity in Hiroshima, I felt I, could, I think I can do it. And similarly, in, in studying Nazi doctors, this is something I believe I can do and want to do. It becomes a question of evolving identity. And it's, I guess, responding to a certain call that combines what's happening in the world outside and something in yourself. Professor Robert J. Lifton for helping us make sense of and confront some of the most horrific moments of our current history. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you.